We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 47. Verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. David, when he confronted Goliath, the giant, he was definitely at odds. There was no way that David was going to win. He was definitely going to lose the battle. However, David was very confident and he believed that he had to fight a really good fight. He had to put in effort because the battle is the Lord's. And that is the title of my message today. The battle is the Lord's. I think that when we're going through our struggles and situations in life, we don't understand the reality of the battle, the worth of the battle. If you have this framework in your mind, literally your life can change and you can live more happily. You can become stronger. You can become actually more mature even. So this sermon will be very life-changing to you in your work life, in your school life, in your interactions with people, with your family, with your church, and just overall yourself in general. Just you. And I hope that this sermon can change your life and help you. Alright, so I don't know if this sermon will help. This is just five minutes what I got from going to the bathroom. Alright, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Wash away my sins with your blood. This sermon was just something that you gave to me within just a couple minutes. Uh, and I had to expound and I have to uh, make it special. And so I crafted it in a way where people can pay attention and hear and get a blessing. I'm going to leave the rest in your almighty hands. May the Holy Spirit take control. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, the first thing that we have to understand is the battle is the Lord's. God is in control of anything, uh, of everything in our life. We can agree with that much. Amen. The Bible says, whatever ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, what's the, what are you supposed to do? Do all to the glory of God. So literally, even the times that we eat and drink, the Lord is in control and we have to give Him the full glory. Now, understanding then that God is in control of everything, of every aspect in our life, then we have to understand this too. The Bible says the battle is the Lord's. If God is in control of everything in our world and everything in our life, then we also have to understand that the battle also belongs to God. And that's extremely important to understand. The battle belongs to God. Amen. If God is in control of everything, and He is in control of the battle, then we must understand that everything that we go through in life contains battle. That is important to understand. So, sometimes we don't realize, and the, uh, we just don't see that literally every aspect we do in our life is battling. Did you hear what I just said? That's going to be extremely important. This is going to change your life. Everything that you do, Everything that you do, even where the Bible says eat and drink, the Lord's in charge of that, but the Lord is also in charge of the battle. Amen. And we have to understand that every aspect of our life belongs to the Lord in His battle. Amen. So everything that you do then is a battle. Now that's going to be helpful for you. Uh, for you. So let, make that the foundation of your life and everything that you do in work, in school, in interacting with people, in the home, in the church, and everything. And this can be life-changing to you. Everything that you go through is a battle. Now I'm going to prove it to you. The proof is found where you have to look at your three enemies. It's as simple as that. Your three enemies. The, uh, the first enemy, which is so obvious, is the devil. So we know that's pretty obvious. Practically anything bad that happens in your life, Christians are prone to say, the devil, you know, it's because of the devil, it's because of the devil. Now, uh, genuinely, we do realize that there is a devil. A lot of times that bad things happen with some people in the home or in our church, I would say quite often that the devil, he's trying to ruin the home, he will try to ruin the church, he would try and ruin uh, people who are in conflict with each other in the church. But then I realize that, uh, and I'm sure you're going to realize that not everything is prone to the devil. Uh, John R. Rice, he's a very famous fundamental independent Baptist pastor. He uh, 
tend to take it to the extreme of the devil, the devil, and then when he had a, uh, uh, I think he busted his leg or something like that, and then he said, the devil pushed me down the stairs or something like that, and Dr. Uckman actually said, no, that's just you not watching yourself when you go up the stairs. <laughs> so, the thing is, is that we can't just attribute everything to the devil quite often. We have to uh, realize that uh, a lot of times it's just our own fault. It's just our carelessness. But, I think that's a given. That's the thing. It's a given. We know that uh, our first enemy is the devil, so everything that we do in life, we don't automatically attribute to the devil. So we don't think that everything that we do in life is the devil's fault or it's some kind of spiritual warfare, so it's just something I go through. But then you forgot your two other enemies. Let's make it more complex now. Let's add the world. The world is your enemy. And that answers pretty much almost 90% of the issues you go through in life, believe it or not. Yeah. So the world, it, uh, everything that you are under is the world system. When you wake up in the morning, you go to job, and then you take care of kids, and then you take care of the spouse, and then you make sure that the house is settled in order. Those of you who are single, you have to work in a job and then go through school, and then some of you take double shifts, and then you have to save up money and plans and dreams. Uh, those of you who are uh, saving up for retirement, everything that we do where we wake up, eat, drink, and everything is run by the world system. So we operate and live and breathe under the world. But we don't realize that that is an enemy to us. Did you hear what I just said? That's an enemy to us. If we were to understand that, then we wouldn't be easily discouraged with uh, hard times happening in the workplace. Oh, why did that happen? Why did the boss misunderstand me? Why did I slip up in the workplace? And oh, why this and that? Why, is, why are there so many forms to sign, you know, to go through this process and to get permission and et cetera, et cetera. That's life, but more so that's the world. Amen. Do you understand that that is a battle to you now? Yeah. Amen. You know, I know that you're just signing forms and it's a normal everyday thing that we go through. Some of you might have to go through financial aid and support. I know that I did that when I went to Berkeley, you know. Ha <laughs> I got your money, suckers. So. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, because Christians, pastors, they don't, and Christian people, they don't have all the money in the world, right? During that time, I was pastoring like really small that time, you know. I was pastoring really small that time. There was no way I was going to survive in the Bay Area. So, uh, through, uh, so I went through that uh, type of lifestyle too, you know, going through financial aid and I had to save money and etc. But uh, that's why it was a lot of pressure for me because I had to pastor a church, do well in Berkeley, interact with people, follow up with the members. Whatever problems happen, I have to handle it. But I have to understand that that is a battle. Yeah. What does battle mean? It means you have to take effort. What does battle mean? You have to sweat. You have to stress out. You have to push in, push yourself to accomplish something. Right. Do you realize that you're in a battle right now? Yeah, this is a little bit more eye-opening. It's not easy to go to church. Who says it is? It's not easy to uh, get your life in order. Who says it is? It's not, and it's definitely, definitely not easy to serve God while sacrificing the world. That requires a lot of battling. What did you think you signed up for, huh? The world. But, even stronger than that, the third, flesh. And that is practically 100% of your life. You know that? There are some struggles that you're going through that some of us would look down and not think that it's something. For example, uh, some of you might be struggling with uh, an addiction where you're just lazy. And that uh, some of you don't have work, some of you don't have school, some of you don't have anything, some of you don't have uh, parents or people around you or a boss or an environment that can push you. And I've been through that situation because I had to do everything by myself. And when you're living by yourself, it's hard to motivate yourself. Especially it's hard to motivate yourself when you keep failing in the workplace and you fail in school. I've been through that. Look, I'm not brilliant and smart and really well managed as you think I am. The only reason why I became that way is because I had to battle right. every second right. my flesh 
in order to accomplish a victory and then become the person that I am with its accomplishments in education and work life and living. Yeah. Is this eye opening to you? Yeah. So look, um, we might frown on you where I don't, I don't want a person say, obviously, and say, oh man, I'm going through such a battle and the demons of hell are onto my tail and it's so difficult and we're like, man, we're praying for you, brother and sister, and you're like, yeah, it's so hard to wake up myself at 8 in, or 7 in the morning. I'm just so used to waking up at 12 p.m. <laughs> and then some of you are like, man, I wake up much earlier than that. I wake up at 5, all right? It's normal for 6 and stuff like that. So the devil made me do it. Yes. The devil made me sleep at five extra hours, man. Oh, man. So, I mean, uh, it is embarrassing, let's be honest. <laughs> None of you are going to say that. By the way, please don't say that during Wednesday night prayer meeting prayer requests, all right? It's best to keep it as an unspoken. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. We got your back. We know you're unspoken. Yeah. We got your back. Yeah. Keep it as an unspoken. <laughs> but now, <laughs> joking aside, but there is something actually we acknowledge that. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to that lazy person. Okay, it is laughable and embarrassing that, oh, you're struggling so much waking up 12 p.m., uh, waking up at uh, 8 in the morning. But you don't realize this, is that to us, that's not a battle. To us, that's tiddlywings. That's like, that's just common sense. But to that individual, it's a battle. You know why? To that individual, that you're not in that same battle the individual is in. We're not in that battle that the same individual is in. And that's called the flesh. The flesh became a crying, spoiled child that rightfully it should be embarrassed that it wakes that's so much in the habit of waking up 12 p.m. And all people are doing is just uh, playing with social media, video games, and watching TV, and catching up with the latest episodes, and watching 100 shows, you know. So that is, uh, that is embarrassing. But we have to understand this, is that to that particular individual, it is a battle to overcome. Why? The flesh has been programmed and so used to it. And that it's such, it's such a serious issue that even lost people, even lost people, I'm not talking about saved. Even lost people recognize that there is a thing called TV addiction. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. You, th you know how powerful music is? Contemporary music is so powerful that a respected uh, psychologist, he mentioned that music is, can be as strong, if not even more powerful than drugs. But that's hearing. What about seeing? What about seeing? It becomes stronger because you're not just hearing, you're looking. So, do you recognize you're in a battle? Yes, it's a battle. And don't tell me that because I'd be, uh, you know, you'd be embarrassed if you told me your battle. Your private personal battle. But to you it is. And do you realize it is a battle to drag your flesh to work? Drag your flesh to to come to church, to drag your flesh to stay disciplined in schedule, to drag your flesh to wake up earlier in the morning, to, dra to make your flesh eat healthy, to make sure that your flesh goes through the procedure and every detail that a complicated school or workplace would demand of you, and let's be honest, even church sometimes, even church. And then it's, it's, it's quite demanding. It's so hard. And now you have to balance now. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're telling me that uh, in the world, we're already busy as it is, and now you add church on top of that? <laughs> Sunday's a time that I want to take a nap, man. <laughs> but it's a battle. Yeah. Yes. And do you realize that? What does, do you understand what battle means? That's the problem with people. They don't understand what a battle means. They think that they're, uh, that they're living in the normal everyday world and that's how the, world, the life should operate. No. 
You have to understand this. It's uh, when you think that way, you brainwash yourself. Because by thinking that uh, everything in life is it, it is as it is, and I just want to live a normal life like all these people, you don't realize that that kind of mindset deceives you. Because what you deem to be normal, you overlook the situations and tensions and everyday problem that people go through that they have to overcome, that they have to manage, that that they have to learn to control. And it's not like a normal level, oh, you know, it's something that people go through and I can handle it and I have to handle it. No, when you actually go through that normal issue, you start to realize how much of a problem you're facing in that normal situation that you didn't see before. When you entered that school, when you entered that job, when you started a family, when you became married, when you started to come to this church. And I don't mean to scare you and I don't want you to run away from the church. But literally everything that you do in interaction in life that is normal. I'm just doing a normal thing coming to church. I'm just doing a normal thing getting married. I'm just doing a normal thing, you know, reading my Bible. I'm just doing a normal thing, you know, uh, waking up in the morning and etc. All of these, re re uh, all of these normal situations will have problems that you have to learn to handle, to overcome, and to control. And then these problems. Problems you don't realize is a battle that you're that you have to overcome Amen. against the flesh yep. and this world system. And then when you have the devil on top of that, all of a sudden bringing a problem out of nowhere, that's worse. See, you're disciplining your flesh every day, so you got a battle to overcome that one. Yeah. And then all of a sudden situations pop up that was on call for that you didn't expect but normally happens in the world. And then when you battle and overcome that, then here comes that wicked one saying, ah, okay, you control that one and that one. Uh, the enemy of the world and the flesh. Let me add something here, just one thing. And all of a sudden, something bad happens that comes out of nowhere that you didn't expect and you just got fired from your job. And then you just failed an exam in the school. A huge fight and eruption bur uh, busted up within the church, within the home. That's what happens. Do you realize that you are in a battle? People don't understand that. See, uh, if you look at second, uh, if you know Second Corinthians chapter four verse seventeen, it is very eye-opening. The Bible says, "For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh forth a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory." That verse recognizes that you know problems that you're facing right now. The Bible doesn't say if those problems are truly genuine. That you can bring it up in a prayer meeting that, oh man, uh, hey, uh, I just, uh, this is a genuine problem I'm going through and I got cancer and then God counts that as suffering. No, the Lord doesn't see it that way. What God counts as suffering and problems is even the little things in life. Yeah. Everyday normal things in life. Good. And that means literally any problem. Right. And it's amazing. You know what God says? Any problem that you stress out in, and you have to fight and overcome, God says there's a reward for that. Didn't you realize that? Amen. Pastor is not going to reward you and pat your back, hey, good job, and coming to church early, you know. <laughs> no, pastor ain't going to do that. It's typical. You should, you know. <laughs> Shame on all of you for coming. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but see, that's the thing is that, uh, you know, pastor may not do that, but the Lord will do that. The Lord will say, I, I remember when you... Uh, dragged yourself out of bed. Yeah. And that temptation was lurking. And not only that, I saw the devil setting it up for you. But I saw you overcome all that. Right. And, pa Amen. and Pastor Kim might say to you, about time that you came to church finally. <laughs> but I say, well done, my child. You did very good. Is this helpful to you? Amen. See, do you realize you're in a battle literally every moment? If you see it as a battle then you, you're going to put up a fight. And when you put up a fight, then you can try to overcome the problem. Fight. Rather than just yielding to the problem, letting the problem take its course and ruin and control your life. You fight. You have to fight. I'm, I'm telling you, fight. I mean, it's not just a fight 
fight through the cancer. It's even fighting through the little things. Fight where you can get a better grade in school. Fight for where you can get along with a brother and sister in Christ even better. Just fight in just waking up earlier in the morning and dragging yourself to church. Just fight in just let, giving out a trap. Yeah. I know it's a lot of those things we would might take it as a given and it's normal, but you got to realize that the worst enemy out there is not the devil, it's your flesh. Yeah. There it is. And every time you overcome this flesh, God says, good job. Yeah. Triple amen. I hope this is helpful for you. Now, another thing to understand is this, is that we don't realize that the everybody, lost people, fight battles too, That's then right. that means. Do you realize that? Why? Because uh, they've yielded yeah. to the three enemies. The devil, the world, and the flesh. They've yielded. So because they've yielded to its system, they fall prey into all the corruption and unfairness in our world. Right. You know, drug, uh, lost people struggle through drug addictions like, say, believers. Lost people struggle with schoolwork and job situations like, say, people. Lost people struggle with situations and crisis in the home, just like saved people. Uh, lost people struggle with situations in their church. Yeah, lost people going to church. I, flash, you didn't know that, right? Lost people go to church too. They go through church problems, church fights, abusive authoritarian positions by pastors, uh, unloving spirits among the church members. Guess what? Lost people go through the same battle like saved people. But you know what? Sometimes they do a better job than save believers. You know why? Let me tell you, let me give you an eye-opening thing. You know why? Because lost people, what they do is that when they look at these problems, they take it as it is that this is problems that I normally go through. If I want to be happy, if I want to get rid of this problem, I need to put my strength and my effort to overcome it. But see, Christians don't do that because we automatically have an assumption God's going to solve it for me. Did I get your attention a bit? Because we automatically have the assumption that, oh, God's going to take care of everything for me and uh, when some bad things happen, then you blame the Lord that, Lord, I don't know that why this bad thing happened and maybe God's trying to tell you because you didn't fight for it, child. Yes. You thought that I would be the one to try to drag you out of bed. I would be the one to make you magically read your Bible. I would be the one that would all of a sudden make your brain to start processing and you get an A plus on the exam. You would think that I, you thought that I would just come inside the business workplace and then all of a sudden make the boss and people see what a good job that you've done. Does the Lord sometimes do that? Sure, sometimes the Lord can do that to help you out and give you grace. But look, uh, your problem is, is that you think too much of that from the Lord. Wow. And you don't take care of the battle. Why? Because you're not using the strength and the power that He knows you have. And He wants you to utilize for His glory. That's good. That's good, brother. I'll tell you what, the world sure fights better than you. The world sure fights better than you with uh, health problems, financial problems, family problems. Yes, even church and ministry problems. Better than you Christians. We don't understand that. I mean, uh, you got to understand this too. Why would the world do that? It's mind-boggling to me why the world would be able to will be willing to go through that, but not Christians. Christians always run away. They want to run away from the problem. They want to escape. But see, the world recognizes they can't do that. So then they have to utilize the world's means to solve their issues. Wait a minute. Man, isn't that sad? You know what they're do using to utilize their worldly problems, their fleshly problems? Their own flesh, the enemy, and their own world, the enemy. And they're of their father, the devil. Wow, that's sad, man. That's really sad. But you got something to fight back against the three enemies. You got a powerful weapon that you can utilize that the world do not have. Amen. You have the power of the great I am that I am. But the problem is, is that you don't believe in Him. Until you believe, then the Lord can work. Until you actually accept it, then He can work. Until you actually implement it and practice out what the Lord told you, then He can work. What did the Bible say? I mean, 
be doers of the word and not hearers only. So you're supposed to do and accomplish stuff, but you can't even do and hear the word until the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, so you can do something until you hear the word and you can hear until you have believing. How can you do something for the Lord without believing? Right. How can you try out what God told you to try out without believing? So you haven't accepted it to begin with. You need to accept it. You know what? I have a strong conviction and belief that God, you called me to pastor a church here and I know that you're going to be able to use it for fruit. I had to have a strong bias and faith in that kind of conviction and that's the reason why the Lord blessed me with all these fruits today. Do you, I mean, I'm so spoiled. God has given me so much fruit at my young age that pastors and missionaries who've been much longer years than I did, who did more hard work than I did, and they don't get as much fruit as I did. Man, isn't that, I'm spoiled, amen? I am spoiled. Why? Because I had a strong faith in the Lord that, Lord, you're going to help me accomplish the task that you've given to me. Right, Why? I had to fight my battle. Yes. I had to believe I'm in a battle dragging myself uh, out of bed and coming to church and, yes, shaving and putting on this monkey suit. It's a battle, bless God. Yeah, you, you, can, be, you can look down on me, but no, this is me, all right? This is mine. So I'm, I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. It's hard to take a shower, amen, every day. <laughs> yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. All right. All right. Unspoken's now out, brother. <laughs> So, <laughs> so the thing is, is that it is a, so of course, uh, that's the embarrassing part, right? <laughs> that you shouldn't be proud about. But you see my point here? My point is I believed. I believed that everything that I went through, that I had to fight for it, yeah. that I had to grip my teeth, that I had to drag myself, that I had to truly crucify all desires of the flesh. And I had to world pouncing on me and giving me a hard time on top of the devil just bringing sudden unexpected things that my poor family has started to come to the conviction that yeah something bad's going to happen you know after something good happens you know I don't know if that happened to you Christians but you know what I mean yeah you know what I mean so uh, so I mean let's be let's be real life is unfair it's not going to be fair to you you think giving up on the Lord and just yielding to whatever life in this world is going to be fair to you? No. Never. It never is. Right. It's a battle. That's good, and the world's fighting. Yeah. How, did, how hard they fought during the coronavirus situation yeah. while Christians had too much peace. <laughs> Christians, I mean, we're just trusting in the Lord, you know. Sure, we may have been a little bit worried about the supplies, but we had each other to support. We had prayer. We had the Lord providing the miracle. If you don't believe it, then you should have dropped dead. All of you are fine to me right now, you know. And some of you are still overweight after the coronavirus. See, so some of you are just fine. Some of you are just fine. So we have to understand, so we have to understand that... Look, though, we have such a great asset. We have just such a great benefit. We have such a higher advantage yeah. in the world. Why can't we fight our battles? Yeah. You know what the Philistines said when they were versing against the children of Israel? They said they got their God with them. But you know what? Let us play the men for our people and let us fight. And guess what? They won against the children of Israel. Why? Because the children of Israel, they didn't have as much faith in the Lord. They had the faith in the wrong thing. They had a faith on a worldly object and a worldly item. You know that? And that's what they believed in. And that's why the Philistines overcame them. The Ark of the Covenant it is a holy item that is made from this world. And that's what the Jews relied on when they versed against the Israelites. It shall save us from our enemies. <laughs> no, they didn't rely on the Lord. Some of you are doing that right now. It shall save me from my enemy. Why? What? Going to the world, your enemy? Come on, brother. The world's way of thinking, how your flesh feels and believes the right pattern it is, how trustworthy are your enemies? They betrayed you. And guess what? They will continue to betray you if you yield and give in once. Battle against the flesh. Battle against the world. Most importantly, it's so invisible that you didn't see it. The devil's behind some of those things. And he'll instigate it. Amen. 
You cannot lose. Uh, it's amazing. The world fights against it no matter how painful it is. You know that? No, no matter uh, how, how painful it is, the world fights through it. Uh, but uh, ourselves, we don't. You know, the, the problem with us Christians is that, you know, when we sing these hymns, when we hear these sermons about, you know, just overcome it, you know, you're going to go through the trial and the suffering, but it's going to be worth it. You're going to understand one day God promised you His blessing, and then He promised you His joy unspeakable and full of glory. But let's be honest, I don't feel that way when I go through a battle. I don't feel that way at all. And then at, at the moment, I'm, I'm thinking it's not worth it. And let's be honest, I'm going to say, you know, doing all this for these blessings of God, ah, I don't feel like it's worth it. It's not worth it. You know why? Because the problem is, is that, see, your only look, uh, your problem is that you don't see it as a battle. Battle is not supposed to feel good. Can I repeat that again? I think some of you don't get that. A battle does not feel good. You know what a battle is? You ever seen a battle before? Or you've been too comfortable in America? And you never saw battles before? You know what a battle is? Look at the Vietnam War. You think that that's a, that's a, they had a happy life? Look at World War I, World War II, the horror stories behind it. Why do you think Dr. Ruckman, he turned PBI not into a nice, beautiful campus like Jack Hiles, but like a war zone? <laughs> And then he said, when you come over here, we train soldiers, not sissies, you know? <laughs> you know, why, why would he do that? Because it made me face real life issues today. And it helped me immensely. No, no. I fought tooth and nail and I got my reward. Yeah, praise the Lord. People, they want a comfortable lifestyle. They want to be a bunch of sissies. They don't want to see a battle. They, that's the problem with you is that you have to see a battle. And when you go through a battle then what happens is it's not worth it while in the middle of battle. Can I repeat that again? While you're fighting, while you're praying, while you're fasting, while you're crucifying the flesh, while you're going through sleepless nights and stressful situations and unspoken prayer requests that you can't share with others and other people don't know about, that those situations, it's not supposed to feel good. It's a battle. Fight the good fight. You have to fight. You have to grit your teeth. Yeah. You have to overcome it. Why? Because it's not worth it all in the battle. It's worth it all after the battle. Right. After, after, and after. And guess what? You're not convinced now. You get convinced years later sometimes. Yeah. You know that? It's years later. Sometimes you'll be convinced. You know, I had to convince... It was hard to... Even your pastor here... I have to confess is that it's hard to convince myself about the joy of the Lord when you're going through school, when you're pastoring a church, when people don't come, when you grow a church and then it shrinks down to two people, and that you got the world, you know, huffing at your heels, and then you got the online presence and pressure and all that kind of stuff. I don't see any joy of the Lord with that. But once I hit my eight and a half years, then I realized it was truly worth it. I gave up all my friends, you know that? I gave up a relationship, a, a love life and a relationship. I gave up everything for the Lord. And boy, has He sure been unfair to me in the fifth year, sixth year. And then when I hit my eight and a half years, I said, Lord, you've been good to me. Yes. When I hit my ninth year, I said, Lord, you've been more than good to me. At my tenth year, I said, look, it's not just worth it all. It's more than that, Lord. And you are worthy of all my praise. My cup is overflowing. You don't see the worth like the world does. You know what the world, when they go through their battle, it's worth it to get a higher paid job. That they're willing to go through sleepless nights. That's worth their pay. And they fight hard. It's worth it to get an A in a class that you're not good at. You might as well flunk, right? They find it worth it to them. And they battle tooth and nail. The world finds it worth it to fight hard to make sure that they have a happy family life, that they spend thousands of dollars for any program for their children, for a psychological counseling for couples, and etc. 
They, they, they find it that much worth it to battle it and pay that much money. Christians, they don't see that it is worth the battle to save their church, to save their family, to save their mental life, to save their physical life. They don't. That's why the world fights battle. Uh, the world battles, and they fight their battles harder than you. They believe it's worth it. You don't. You don't. You think the world sees the worth in it going through sleepless nights for the past, what, three to four years of college and something like that? They don't see, <laughs> what is that? You know what? They're not seeing that. They're looking at their future reward. You don't. You doubt the promises of His words. It's that simple. When God promised you His future, He spoke it in His word. It's not just hearsay, and it's not just something that was passed on through word of mouth. He marked it on His word that is infallible. He marked the promise that's infallible, unbreakable in His word. How can an unbreakable vow in His word be broken and doubted by you? You don't believe his future reward. But you sure believe the future rewards that the world promises you. You sure believe the devil when he says, All these kingdoms will I give to you and the glory of it if you bow and worship me. You sure believe your enemies more than your best friend who died for you. The thing is, we don't think this way when you're going through your trial when you're trying to overcome temptation. You don't think, this is a battle I cannot lose. I don't know what your struggle is, or what your stressful situation is, but the thing is, you need to start saying, this is a battle I cannot lose. But some of you just might give up. Some of you might just throw in the towel and say, I could care less about the battle anymore, and stuff like that. But guess what? The world says, this is a battle I cannot lose when they're going through their college. When, they're, when they use all their bills, pull out all their loans, and then their parents become in debt. The world is so amazing, they think, this is a battle I cannot lose. To believe the propaganda of liberalism and to go through the higher education system. This is a battle I cannot lose. What? Uh, that, that, that it doesn't make sense. Christians cannot do that uh, when God promised peace, joy, and gold, silver, precious stones, and God promised that He would make all things work together for good. You can't do it for a promise like that. You can't think this is a battle I cannot lose. You know what some of you do? Some of you just say, you, know, you don't think that way, so you've just renounced the battle and say, you know, it's okay that I can lose Romans. I can lose what the Bible promised at Philippians. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's okay to lose that. It's okay to uh, lose the promise of Romans 8.28. That all things work together for good to them that love God. It's okay to lose the promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That my grace is sufficient for you through the trial. It's, oh, it's alright that I could let go and lose the promise of 1 Corinthians 10.13 that... No temptation is greater than I can carry. And God is faithful who will pull me through. It's okay that I can lose the promise of God saying that, you know, no matter what sin or mistakes you make through the process, I'll forgive you and use you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. It's okay that I lose the promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where God promised, and 1 Corinthians 3, where God promised rewards for eternity. It's okay that I lose those promises. But the world sure, sure don't think that way for a piece of paper by the time they graduate. It's not worth losing this. The Hollywood actors and actresses, it's not worth it for this piece of junk metal. Right. Not, not worth losing that. I will go through sleepless nights. I will wait on tables. You know the actor and actress, uh, that kind of business is unrealistic. All right? You know how much hard work and effort they have to pull? Some of these big famous ones, they had to sleep on park benches, actually. And they had to wait on tables. But you know what they were thinking? It's worth it to have that accolade at the end. What in the world? Accolade 
uh, accolade through there and not up in heaven where thousands upon thousands and most of all your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives the standing ovation. Say good job and well done thou good and faithful servant. Amazing. Mind boggling. You Christians are sure something that you don't believe the battle is worth it. It's a battle I cannot lose. Amen. Why? Isn't it worth it that you have happiness mentally? Right. Happiness restored in the church. Yes. Happiness restored in the family. Happiness restored in relationship. Happiness restored in the workplace and studying life. Yes. Happiness restored, most importantly, in your very own life. Worth the battle. You need to fight. You know, it's so amazing. I find like atheists, especially atheists who die without God, how can they live like that? You know, Christopher Hitchens, he, he used his voice to always uh, use all the skills in the world, reasoning and debate skills in the world, to uh, disprove the existence of God. And then he got cancer. Guess where? And his voice. You know what he had? Conviction. So you know what he wrote down? He wrote down, some of you Christians might say that this is God's judgment on me for mocking him. But you know what? Uh, uh, the same could be said of you Christians, and he used his logic, re reasoning skills to try to justify the cancer in his voice. And he believed in his pain that it was worth it to go through that, to deny Jesus Christ and then risk an eternal hell at his last nine breaths. The world thinks it's worth it. And that's why they fight their battle. Hitchens fought hard, tooth and nail. But you don't. You know why? There's a difference with you two. They have a strong doctrine. You don't. Ooh. Wow. Wait, wait, hey, pastor. Oh, hold, we're all about doctrine. Bible-believing truth. How many times have I seen in the video? Dun, 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 dun. King James only. Dun, 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 dun. Dispensationalism. Dun, dun. How many times, Pastor? You know? I, it's, if, if it's one thing that we Christians have, it's doctrine. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't believe it as solid as doctrine that you would lose, lose it all. That's what the world has. That's what Hitchens had. He knew he'd lose everything if he renounced his doctrine. He, he betted his whole life on a doctrine that God did not exist. And believing in that doctrine, he thought it was worth the pain of going through cancer in his voice and reject Jesus Christ and risk a burn, burning eternal hell. Look at the liberal activists, you know? You think that they had, a, uh, they had it made? I mean, even the min minorities. I know today that the homosexual agenda, the sodomites, and then all the other messed up liberals, they have it made now. But back then, when they started their propaganda, you know what? They fought a tooth and nail against the majority within their system. They fought tooth and nail, and then they, uh, they, were, they were willing... You gotta realize this, there were sodomites willing to be disowned by family to maintain the doctrine of their lifestyle they believed in to be true and real. And they believed it was worth it. But you Christians sure don't, do you? When family disowns you, you, you chicken out. When job disowns you, school disowns you, everything in life disowns you, you chicken out. Why? You don't have strong conviction in your doctrine. That's why the church emphasizes so much on doctrine. Do you realize that? You know what? You know what made me prevent me from quitting? Let me try to help you understand here. You know what prevented me from quitting the ministry? I had a strong conviction in doctrine. I knew that this was the Bible-believing truth that would give all of Bible-believing truth in the liberal Bay Area, and that is where God called me, to be, called me to be. When I believed in that, I believed it as doctrine. I made an indoctrinal context to me. And I was like, I cannot quit. And you know how many enemies were attacking me? And some of the people would know that too. But you know what I did? I fought tooth and nail. I had to do it. Why? Because... Everything I risked on this one thing. Bible believing truth. Worth it. And guess what? I believed it was worth it. God don't have to convince me anymore. 
But at the moment, I didn't remember. At the moment, it was hard. I had to just keep fighting those. See, that's what battling is. It's fighting. It's trying to fight the doubt. It's trying to fight the pain. It's trying to fight through the tears and the stress. And fight for your life! And the only way you can do that is that you have a strong implant and conviction on doctrine. You know, some of you who are going through, I don't know what kind of suffering you're going through, but guess what? You're not going to get help no matter how many times you come to this church unless you fix your doctrine. Yep. Especially for some of you who've been here for a while now, you better know all your doctrines right now. Yep. You might say, why is that important to me? Because it's that important. Doctrine is a more of a conviction mindset. It is a framework that transforms your life. Yes. And we've seen that with the liberals today, with their act, uh, within their activist movement, and even atheists like Christopher Hitchens. And if you don't believe that, look at all the Christian martyrs who died. You know how they were able to stomach and go through the pain of torture and death? They had a strong doctrine that Roman paganism is wrong, that Jesus is truly real. He did raise himself from the dead. So yeah, Roman soldier, you might criticize me for that, but I believe in that doctrine as truth, as real to me. He is alive. He is real. Christianity is real. Pa Roman paganism is false. I'm willing to die for that. Yes. Wow. Do you know that you, you should only have one Bible, the King James Bible? Amen. Do you know that uh, the doctrine of dispensationalism Dispensationalism, it teaches that we get raptured before the tribulation. That verses in the Bible where you think talks about good works for salvation, they are applied to Jews. Tongues, healings, and visions, we don't believe it's available today. That was something at a different time period for Jews. We believe that the nation of Israel, that even though it is evil now, God will restore them in the future and they are still His people. We believe that there is apostasy in churches. And yeah, you know, um, why, are, why don't we get along with uh, other churches? Why don't I hold hands with John MacArthur and other people? You know why? Because I've been ruined by doctrine. And I know the apostasy of their beliefs in Calvinism, in not growing more in doctrine, in lack of dispensationalism. And they don't use a perfect word of God, the Bible. They keep using the NIV, ESV, and they use the New King James, etc. Because of that, I can't. Why? I have a strong doctrine. Because how can God bless my life if I don't live in truth? I must live in truth so that God can bless my life. I must be honest and truthful to Him so that He can be truthful and honest and real to me when He blesses me. Amen. Not just do it partially or half-heartedly. If you're half-hearted with God, then He'll do it half-hearted to you. Yeah. Some of you are probably uh, so troubled by that because you're not used to hearing that about doctrine. That's why you need to study. What have you been doing? You need to study. You need to come to me. You need to go to one of these brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I don't understand about the King James Bible issue. Why is that right and every other Bible version is wrong? You need to go to one of us. You need to go to your pastor here and you need to say, why is dispensationalism true? Why are we raptured before the tribulation, etc., etc.? But see, you don't care. You just go like everybody in the world. Everything's just normal. Right. I'm just going with the flow of what's normal. And no wonder you get stressed out when problems happen in life. You don't, if you have a strong doctrine to begin with, you see spiritual warfare eventually behind it. Amen. Amen. You need to start believing in doctrine. Are you saved? That's the most important doctrine. Right. Are you saved? If you've been in our church all these years and you never got saved, and I mean the proper right salvation, you can't just say, oh, I just got saved, and yeah, you know, uh, you don't need to tell me and stuff like that. No, you need to check and make sure yeah. your doctrine is correct on your saved. Yeah. If you don't have a care in the world about that, then the devil and the world and the flesh is going to get you one way or the other. What? And you need to get your doctrine straight. I mean, how many times have I offered you at the end of the service to get saved? But you would not get saved. Why? There's pride in there. There's a lack of concern about proper right doctrine. I knew this. God can't bless. I strongly believe this. 
any happiness and reward and blessing that you see in this church and you enjoy in this church is because it started out with something. I told the Lord, and I've told some of you about this before, and I'm going to say it again, is that I made a promise to the Lord, I will not compromise in doctrine no matter what. Even if I have just two people in my church and I go through pain and hardship, Lord, I cannot compromise. Amen. So Lord, because of that, I'm going to have to trust in you to bless me. Did he not? Did he not? If there is a big, great revival meeting or a summer camp meeting that we have that other churches don't see, I'm not going to arrogantly and pridefully say, oh, it's because I'm smart and I did a well job. No, I hope people realize because I stand uncompromising for right doctrine. And maybe other churches should do that too. Maybe the world needs to see that. The world needs to understand that. I want the online world to understand that as well. I want people in this church to understand that. I need to stand true, strong and true to doctrine. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's His very own essence. Right. And the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I need the right Bible. Jesus says, study to show, th show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. See, dispensationalism is truth. Doctrine is truth. God went as so far as to say at Romans 16, don't fellowship those who have their doctrine wrong. Yeah. Why? Because that's His very own essence. And He cannot honor and bless if you're in wrong doctrine. Are you truly saved? If not, you need to get saved right now. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 is such a powerful verse. And y'all memorize that for your memory verse. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul, he fought tooth and nail. And he could say that I finished my battle at the end. And he could lay it down. The worth of the battle. It's worth it. I want to encourage you to fight that. And I want you to believe that it's worth it. You know why you don't believe it's worth it? Because of the pain that you're going through. Because you don't see and you don't truly understand and believe that the future reward it really tastes that good. You may have heard about the future reward, but some of you, when you hear about the future reward, you might say, oh, yeah, but it's not a big deal. Not until you taste it. Who are you to judge until you taste it? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's one thing I learned. That's my challenge to any worldly person. I'm tasting it now, and I'll tell you one thing. Don't go to the world. It's not worth it, please. And that's the thing that I want to encourage this church is to fight hard and encourage you that it is worth it. You know why? Because all in all, you don't realize this. Now, I don't know if some of you see this. Do you notice that small little dot right here in this pulpit? You know what that is? That is all your pain. That is all your thoughts about not worth it, not worth it. That's how long your battle life is. When you look at the end of this line through this pulpit, that's all the worth it. That's why you should fight. It's not worth it right here. See that? Not worth it. You don't believe in it. You don't feel in it. But once you step just right over here, just even here, you've reached about a million years of the beginning of eternity and you'd realize it was truly worth it. And you have so much more beyond to go. The battle is the Lord's. Every head bow and every eye shut. I, you are going through a battle. I know it. If any of you are going through a battle, the altar call is open. And give it to the Lord. Surrender your life to Him. You can pray in your seat or you can pray on the altar's floor, however way the Lord deals with your heart. You need to fight. You need to realize it is a battle. And you need to see that it's worth it to save my own life. It's worth it to save people around me on their life. And you need to fight. Tooth and nail. It's worth it. The problem with people is they don't see it as a battle. The problem is, is that they, they see too many at challenges and the pain. And that's why they give in to the enemy. But see, you know, you're not going to be much different from the lost world. You're not going to be much different from them. You fall prey to their system. The enemy's system. You need to fight. Because it's worth it. Of course you don't believe it now. And I don't expect you to believe it now. You know why? You're that little dot right there. And it feels pain and sorrow. And there's a belief in there too. The doubt on God's promises. It's in there. I'll acknowledge that. 
And I'm not proud enough, I'm not proud to admit that. I wish I could have believed uh, more, more purely on the Lord. But you see that, um, see, you're looking at, uh, you're believing in the wrong thing. You're only looking at that little dot. That's why. Until you step, until you step the zenith and the peak and the borderline of eternity, that's when you believe. That's when you see it. When God finally gives you the fruit and then all the blessings that follow, then you will believe. You need to believe that right now, right now what you're going through is a battle. Some of you are struggling with certain emotions right now, perhaps, because of some kind of suffering and trial in life or a temptation that keeps overriding you and it's so hard to overpower. Listen, let me encourage you, brother and sister in Christ, it's a battle. We need to realize there is pain, sorrow, and stress, but it's worth it and you need to fight it. You need to believe in it. You need to believe in God's power. God, my Father, I pray that uh, today's preaching has touched people and it will convict them and that they will be able to repent and renew their life. Before I close in prayer, I want to ask you if you are truly saved. If you are to die, die right now, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Don't let pride, don't let ignorance blind you. Don't lose your conviction in doctrine. Are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven after you die? You might say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I want to get saved. Very simple. One, you need to realize that you're going to burn in hell because of your sin. Well, that's a given, Pastor. I already know that. I've sinned and I'm going to burn in hell. Good. Second point. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. Why did He do that? So His blood can wash away the sin. You've heard that gospel story a thousand times, but you don't understand the true meaning behind it. He died. He had to die. He had to raise himself from the dead. Because that very act is where he shed the blood to clear the sin. Because remember, sin puts you in hell, right? He needs to clear that sin. You might say, okay, I understand that. Then if you understand it, then why are you relying on going to church to save you? Why do you rely that I have to clean up my act and my sin, I have to really repent all my errors so that I can go to heaven? If you really believe Jesus died to save you, then I don't understand why you believe that I have to be a disciple, follow Jesus Christ, do all these good things to get saved. Then you don't really understand the power of the cross. You don't really understand why He died and buried. To clear every sin you've done from past, present, and future. You have to only believe in that and that alone and you can't trust in anything that you do to save you. If you now understand it, the third point is you need to say it to the Lord. You might say, well, pastor, I don't know how to say it to God. Can you help me? Sure, I'll give you the words on how to say it and you can repeat after me. It's totally private and you can keep it to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say, God, I repent as a sinner I don't want to burn in hell. I only believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so His blood can save me. I'm only believing in that alone to save me. Not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you could bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please. Just one last time. And we're going to finish it off here. This is totally private. I'm not going to point out who you are. Now, if you've done this with me before, you know, this sinner's prayer with me before, don't raise your hands. But if this is your first time doing it with me right now, and it's genuine, could you slip up your hand real briefly? That way I can pray to the Lord for you. And I'm not going to point out who you are. Could you just slip up just real briefly, real quick? Anybody here? Okay. Thank you for your honesty. I'm going to take it as it is. Let's close it with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I trust that each and every soul here is saved, truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that they will get their doctrine straight and see the importance of it, that they should only use the King James Bible, that they should believe in dispensationalism, that they should see the importance of attending a right church, not just a Baptist church, but actually a Bible-believing Baptist church. 
and that they will use these doctrines and this strong conviction and belief in it where they will risk everything onto it and they will push themselves to fight the battle. Help us to realize that things that we go through in life is not something that we can escape and it's just normal situations but we believe personally that it is my fight and I need to drag myself and fight tooth and nail and drain all I've got and the power and ability that I got to overcome that giant and at least get one victory in my life. In Jesus name I pray. Amen.